Hi, uh, my name is Sammy Reed. I'm a videographer and based in Berlin. Um, seeing the name living a year open source, you might think I'm here to talk about software, but uh, software has never been a particular interest of mine necessarily. What I'm interested in is probably what most of you are very interested in as well, which is um, systems and tools that uh, enable, facilitate, and encourage people to share and collaborate. Um, and I first got interested in this kind of thing uh, a few years ago. I'd been living in an absolutely chaotic house with uh, seven different people. There was no organization, no responsibility. It was a filthy pigsty. And I basically decided that from that moment on, I was never going to live with a large amount of people again. I was only going to live in you know, two or three person houses, no big houses whatsoever. Um, and then all of a sudden, I found myself living in this place, the big house. Um, this is in Auckland, New Zealand, 21 people, 21 bedrooms. Everybody cooking together, eating together, doing everything together. And you might think with three times as many people, there'd be three times the chaos. But in fact, this worked amazingly well. They had all sorts of systems in place, uh, consensus decision making. They had um, chore systems where every week you'd do a chore. If you uh, didn't do your job, you paid 15 euros extra, $15 extra in rent. And other people could do that job for you and get that $15. Uh, so just very simple little. Uh, systems that made living with other people, collaborating and sharing with other people very, very easy and it made it a lot of fun as well. And while there I started reading about all sorts of other uh, collaborative systems and um, uh, other ways that people can live and work and share together. Um, and so I started reading books like uh, these two, Goethe Bankler and uh, the um, uh, more from the academic side of things and Superflex from the artistic and political uh, side of things amongst many other things. And over the last few years, I grew more and more interested in um, these alternative ways of living, alternative ways of organizing. But I was always just reading and uh, finding out about things and being interested in, in things. But I was always a spectator. I was never actually taking part. And this I kind of saw as a bit of a problem. I, I heard about uh, this idea of open source and I started reading about open source hardware and Arduino and things like that. But I didn't feel like I could actually take part in that. I wasn't a software developer, uh, I couldn't write legal licenses, I uh, couldn't engineer 3D printers or anything like that. But then I realized that actually maybe I could use this lack of technical knowledge, this lack of technical background to actually do something positive uh, for open source. Um, and so I came up with the idea of Year of Open Source, which is, uh, it's been running since August the 1st. Um, I am basically throwing myself into the open source ecosystem and documenting the process through videos. So um, what basically happened on August the 1st was I uh, stopped buying any traditionally copyrighted and patented products. Um, I got rid of my proprietary Apple operating system, switched to entirely free software, and said goodbye to Final Cut Pro and everything like that. Um, I also uh, had to go through my music library and see uh, if I could only focus on um, what's called kind of open source music, so free culture and um, basically music that I could reuse, remix, sample, should I want to. Um, I did find some elements of my, uh, my music library that I could reuse, the old blues from the 1920s and 30s. Some of that is public domain. Some of that can be used in your own projects, remix, things like that, but uh, only if the author of that work has actually died a significantly long enough time ago. In Europe, it's 70 years, so I went on this morbid kind of Wikipedia call seeing when all my favorite musicians had been killed. Uh, so Bessie Smith, car accident, uh, Blind Lemon Jefferson got lost in a snowstorm, and uh, Robert Johnson, uh, someone poisoned his whiskey, which is rather unfortunate because he could have written some great blues about that. Um, but uh, my project isn't about just avoiding copyright and patents. It isn't, a, it isn't a year of public domain. I want to show what the open source culture does um, and how open source uh, uh, items, products, projects can be reused and repurposed. And so I wasn't so much focused on the public domain, I was more focused on free culture. So this is a shot from a film, Cedar Sings the Blues, one of the most uh, uh, important and successful um, free cultural um, films. There haven't been too many um, uh, released, but this is the most popular. Um, so I've been uh, watching uh, Libra license, Creative Commons license films and uh, uh, reading books and, uh, and music, but this isn't just about consuming uh, free cultural products. It isn't just about replacing the, um, uh, the things that I had um, and living a normal consumerist lifestyle. One of the aspects of free culture and of open source is the uh, ability to be a producer as well as a consumer. So that means not just 
watching these things but actually using them. So I'm creating videos that uh, utilize photos, uh, images, music, all under open um, uh, Creative Commons licenses available for any use. Um, I've also been looking into open education as well. So um, I had no technical background before. I'd never programmed a, sim a single Hello World program in my life. Um, and so I decided that open education was not uh, a perfect opportunity for this. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer university runs a thing called the Mechanical MOOC, which is a, an online course um, using, um, uh, using courseware from many different institutions, many different sources, and uh, it's basically a mechanized um, uh, automatic um, email out of your, your homework for the week and everybody is doing this around the world at the same time. So it's an interesting approach, but I was more interested in uh, something called Open Tech School. This is uh, an initiative that started in Berlin and uh, they've now spread to all sorts of different places around the world and these are two of the, um, uh, the team, it's actually quite a large team. These guys are trying to teach tech to a much wider um, uh, audience. They're using um, curriculum and writing curriculum that anyone can use. Um, and so I did an interview with them, I tried to explain what it is they're doing and uh, did workshops with them. And now I'm going to be presenting a, a, a workshop with them as well, teaching video editing to people with no background in it as well. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, actual physical things because it's open hardware that really drew me to open source and I think it's one of the best ways to explain open source concepts. Um, and uh, a lot of people talking about open source 3D printers, CNC machines, things like that. I want to start with the very first digital uh, manufacturing machine, which is the knitting machine. These have been around since the, <clears throat> since the 60s. They used to be made with uh, punch cards. And basically since the 80s, they haven't really been used very much. These ones uh, were run on floppy disks, so if you don't have um, your own uh, floppy disk drive, if you, if you don't have your own piles of uh, designs from the 80s, you can't use them. So this machine was saved by uh, open hardware. People hacking it, reverse engineering it, and sharing what they'd learned amongst themselves. One of these people hacking it uh, was Sadien Sevier. Um, she's a, a wonderful, incredibly talented uh, hacker, um, mathematician, musician, knitter, everything. This admin. And um, she showed me what, what uh, she showed me the work that she'd done the creation she'd made, and explained a little bit about the history of uh, how these machines work, how open hardware development works, and we made a video of that. But again, I didn't just want to learn about it, I wanted to show the process of making things, so with her I developed a, um, a hat as well. Uh, I wanted to build on uh, the commons, as with free culture, so I went into um, the Public Domain Review, it's an excellent website of lots of fantastic uh, historical artifacts in the public domain, and I found these beautiful snowflakes from 1863, scientific images um, drawn from observations through microscopes. And uh, I decided to repurpose these and turn them into uh, a design for a hat. So I brought them into my image editing software, turned them into uh, all this uh, kind of 80s looking pixel glory, and turned that into a hat with Fabian on the knitting machine. And this hat and its design, of course, uh, fully open source, so if you want to recreate it, use the original design, turn it into sunshine or whatever you want, you can do that. Um, but uh, talking about fashion, I mean, fashion is a low IP area. Fashion, like hats and clothing, uh, there is not a huge enough copyright protection. So if you want to copy this shirt, you can copy this shirt. Um, but for me, the idea of... Uh, Open source is also about um, enabling people to produce things without having to do all of the work themselves, so they're not starting them from zero. So I wanted to provide uh, patterns for clothing, I needed to make my own clothing, and uh, I decided to start with the most pressing need, underwear. So I went to Spunty Events, she is um, a tailor and a designer, she works at Nadelund, which is a co-sewing space in Berlin, and uh, I talked to her about my plan to make some underwear. And she helped me to explain, <coughs> she explained how patterns work, and we worked out how they were going to basically come together to form these, this pair of underwear. And I realized that if I was sharing my underwear with the world, sharing these designs, they would only actually be suitable for people with exactly the same proportions as me. And so I decided to make this design parametric, meaning you can put in your waist measurements and you can adjust that pattern to, uh, to fit. 
I don't think the video is going to play, so I won't uh, I can, uh, show you the video later on. But uh, basically, I had to learn a little bit of basic programming for it. You know when you're sitting in a maths class when you're at high school and you're looking up at the board and you're forced to do all of these algebraic equations and you're thinking, what practical purpose could this awful, torturous, terrible uh, uh, thing actually, actually produce? The practical purpose, as I've finally learned after many years of struggling, is uh, making underwear. You need <laughs> algebraic equations to create parametric underwear. Uh, and then under uh, Sponge's Watchful Eye, I uh, managed to sew them all together. And I've got the underwear right here. Very comfortable. I was able to choose my own, uh, my own material, my own uh, cut, and everything like that. I mean, you can really uh, customize an awful lot when you're making things yourself. One thing, there's this, uh, the fly here. Um, guys who have the, uh, the fly on their underwear, how many of you, can you raise your hand, how many of you use the fly? One, two, three? <laughs> yeah. Me personally, I'm not a fly man, so I didn't actually do a proper fly on this. I thought I'm going to save myself the time, didn't include it in the pattern. We've got a little fake fly there because I like the look, but I don't use it. <laughs> um, one other thing I want to talk about is um, uh, open design. <coughs> so I wanted to explain the concept of open design, which is basically anybody can. Um, the download designed by professional designers or, or amateurs, they can repurpose it, they can adjust it for their, own, for their own purposes. And this is all very nice as long as you can actually use 3D software, as long as you know how to design things um, in, uh, in 3D and Blender and things like that. So what I found, I found this wonderful program called SketchTip, which actually, which actually solved a lot of the problems uh, for me. You don't need to know uh, how joints come together when you're building physical furniture, you don't need to know that much about CNC machines and you don't need to know anything about 3D design. You simply draw a line and this uh, software kind of extrapolates that line into a 3D uh, chair of slats, as you can see here. And so this is uh, a chair that I designed after about three days of uh, confused kind of flailing around, not really knowing what kind of chair I actually wanted. It's a little tricky when you're not a chair designer and not actually thinking about chairs the entire time when you sit down and decide you want to design a chair. Um, and as you can see, it basically creates um, all of the pieces you need to cut it out with a CNC machine. And um, one other thing about this whole culture of, of making 3D printing CNC machines is that it's still producing more and more stuff. And this is not necessarily what our planet needs. And I thought, well, maybe there's a way of using I mean, this gives you an opportunity to choose what materials you make it out of. Just like making your own clothing, you can choose your own fabric. Here, you can choose your own materials as well. You don't need to go to some uh, huge big store and get kind of fresh virgin rainforest and cut your uh, uh, cut your, your uh, chair out of that. And so, um, this week, um, that's my little model I made of paper. <coughs> this week, I'm going to the Kunststoffe um, market in Berlin, which is a place uh, in Berlin where they basically gather up materials, uh, scrap materials, uh, trash, second-hand things, and they gather it all and they uh, promote these, um, uh, they basically bring artists to their space and uh, artists can use this material. So I'm going to go there for a minute to view with them, show what they're doing and use their, their wood to cut my chair up. I'm also going to be doing that in the Fab Lab, brand new Fab Lab in Berlin, um, and it's just being built at the moment and I want to use this experience to explain how Fab Labs work too. Uh, so there's a community aspect of this particular fab lab, as with many. There's a, a commercial service, or you can do it in a community way, and I want to show that process too. So I can go there, I can cut out my chair using the CNC machine, but then I have to give something back to the community as well. So in that case, I'm organizing a workshop in a couple of weeks' time with both, and we're going to be explaining the concept of uh, open design, how that all works, the idea of a, uh, a user as designer or as co-designer, and then allow the participants in the workshop to cut out little models like my, my cardboard model you saw before. So a very clear way of explaining to people the machines in a fab lab, how a fab lab community works, and the benefits of uh, making things yourself. <coughs> um, now my project, my, I'm out of time, so I'll just uh, wrap up now. My project is called Year of Open Source. The idea was to do this for one year from August 1st until August 1st. Um, so you may wonder what I'm going to be doing on August 1st. I'm going to the movies. Um, that's one thing that I'd definitely be missing is just normal 
movies going to, 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 to Hollywood movies. There are no um, uh, free culture movies at uh, my local cinema, the open air cinema. But other than that, not too much is going to change. I found the process to be a wonderful, enjoyable process, if somewhat slow. Um, and so because I haven't been able to achieve everything that I wanted to achieve in this year, I'm basically going to keep it going. So the year of open source is pretty much turning into the life of open source. Um, I'm always open to ideas, collaborations, um, and uh, suggestions. So here are my contact details. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.